so much, and it's nice to feel home be home. Between being the oppressor and being the oppressed, many of you know that I chose to be a bridge between both, and that was a way of healing for me. I just learned that my son Tarek is 25. Many of you heard him speaking the 21st of March this year. And they are telling me he did a good job, and I was, I was happy that he is, I hope that he is better than his dad, because we don't want to be a, a Xerox machine. <laughs> So then we know there is some development improvement. But saying that uh, and reporting about the situation in Iraq, uh, I'm sorry to tell you, it's in Iraq, it's today is better than tomorrow. That's what you hear in the news. And that what will you continue to hear in the news since 2003, unfortunately. When the change took place by the removal of uh, the dictator Saddam Hussein in 2003, some Iraqis thought probably things would be better. And the idea of going in a war against Iraq uh, was sold here as if we fight them there rather than we fight them here. So the front of the Terrorism, as George Bush uh, Jr. pictured it, it's in Iraq. But actually, all this called so-called Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS today, they came to follow the, <laughs> the presence of the US in Iraq. But still, as we learn, when the weapon of mass destruction was not found, linked to Al-Qaeda between the previous regime and Al-Qaeda was not there. Link to 9-11 was not there. This is according to the congressional uh, investigation of 9-11. It's bipartisan committee which proved that, but insisted Blair and Bush that they are bringing to Iraq democracy and freedom. And as just Maurice said, war is about stealing resources and war about death and long time suffering. Um, the news since June 2014 was about ISIS. And I would like, instead of reading as it is here, I move the I here. And it's about oil and weapon, selling weapons. Wars always result of who sells more weapons in the West, as you know. And a recent, uh, I have some numbers here for you, a recent uh, report done by an organization, Swedish organization, called Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. So according to the SIPRI, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, there is a hundred largest arm producers sold a combined 400 and two billion worth of arms and military service in 2013. 
US and European arms companies continued, continued to dominate the top 10 global companies in terms of arms deals. Lockheed Martin was the global leader with 36 billion in arms sales in 2013. US companies still dominate the arms market by a large margin with six among the top 10 arms sellers. For the top 100 arms producing companies, 39 are based in America and accounted for more than 59% of total arms sales among the top 100. Of the top 10 alone, made up 35% of total arms sales among the top 10, 100. National governments, especially the US, are almost always the primary customers for these companies. And they are often the only customers that can afford the extremely high cost of these products. For example, an F-35, which is not yet around, it will be produced probably, starting producing 2018, and if it's bought by our government and, and, and delivered in 2020, the rough price for that jet flight jet, it's about $100 million. You see wars in Middle East from coast to coast, from sea to sea. Libya, Yemen today, and Yemen just, uh, Saudi Arabia one attacked Yemen, uh, struck a deal about $138 billion with the US. Um, Syria, the, the bleeding of that country by both the people of Syria, whether they are supporters of the regime or the opponents, been killing each other since 2010-11 and continuing to do so. In Iraq, I live in Najaf with my family. Najaf is about 100 miles south of Baghdad. Safety is relatively there, much more than north of Baghdad. So it's the southern provinces of Iraq, they enjoy kind of safety. But we receive every day at least 100 to 150 body bags, members of our families who goes and fight so-called ISIS in the north. So the whole country is affected by, by what's going on. Today is better than tomorrow in Iraq. The office that MPT, Muslim Peace Packer teams, has it in Iraq Every day we get at least five to 10 people asking us how to leave the country. Life is unbearable anymore in Iraq. With the prices of the oil dropping, the government depends only on the oil sale since it came. And it had and has a huge annual budget, the fixed budget, budget for the whole country, more than $100 billion a year. But that money, the people don't see it. We don't see it in a form of project that uh, delivered to the people in, in terms of uh, public services, like 
electricity is still on and off, but much better than before. And at this time, actually, we cannot judge how the electricity is because we don't need much uh, energy, the weather kind of mild. But water is bad, as always. Health conditions is going much worse than before. Education hasn't been developed. And the government is saying, we cannot do all of this because we are a state of war. So it seems to be the war in Iraq, violence and instability are uh, endless. The tunnel still has no light at the end of it. The tunnel is Iraq, that what we witness today. So any talk about Iraq, about Middle East, without pointing out the main actor who is benefiting of this situation would be BS, excuse me. And the only party who is definitely benefiting from this situation, when we say ISIS is a dollar sign or IS is a dollar sign, we mean the profit and it's, it's not necessarily money, it is about selling arms and stealing oil, but it's also about the security of Israel as Israel said that the Arab world should be in chaotic situation. The people, the population of the Arab country should kill each other as uh, Moshe Yalon, the minister of defense of Israel who recently made a statement saying, we will be happy to kill our enemies, but we will be enjoying more and be happy more when our enemies are killing each other. And our strategy will be to inject the Arab world, the enemies, with those militias to continue the inner fights. That's Moshe Yalom. Recently, about four weeks ago, the head of the intelligence agency, the Israeli intelligence agency, visited Saudi Arabia and informed the authority that, show them satellite pictures. If you remember uh, Cheney when he visited Saudi Arabia, back in 1991 and show them that some pictures, funny pictures of Iraqi army at the border of Saudi Arabia. And at that time, uh, Dick Cheney requested to have the US forces to be in Saudi Arabia so Saudi Arabia will not be in danger by Saddam forces. At this time, the head of the Israeli intelligence uh, agency visit again Saudi Arabia, show them pictures of Iranian rockets in Al Hudayda port. This is in Yemen. And telling them these rockets will reach Tel Aviv, including you Saudis, Riyadh. And those rockets, the Iranian, ha the Houthis have them. So we should do something about it. And therefore, the Saudis and some Arab Gulf countries, all Arab countries, uh, Gulf countries except Oman, Pakistan, Egypt, Jordan, uh, if I miss any country, all of them together and co combined, they uh, uh, attacked Yemen and still the war is going on. 
So like Yemen needs this, it's already in turmoil. It's already uh, devastated by inner fight. So again, who is benefiting of this as we see only Israel, but for how long? And how many they will conspire to kill more Arab populations? Arab populations are many. With the threats, see, if you remember in 2003, the first thing Bremer did when he was assigned as the civilian administrator, the US Iraqi civilian administrator in Iraq, he disbanded the Iraqi army, was described as the fourth largest army in the world. And also, he implemented another order called the debatifications. But disarming Iraq led to have militias or armed people to come from out of side the country like ISIS. <coughs> but now, because we need the army, we don't have it. It's very weak. The Iraqi government is thinking seriously to establish or to restore the old army. So could uh, this army defend itself, uh, itself, the country, and the border of the country? Well, uh, let's have the questions later, but I can answer this. Um, actually, some of the old leaders, generals of the old army, were needed by Al-Maliki, and he recruited them back to use their expertise, but it was too late. But most of the disbanded generals of the old army now working with ISIS, that's the dilemma. And because Maliki then has done a bad job by discriminating against the Sunnis, sectarian strategy against our brothers and sisters, the Sunnis, the Iraqis, what happened, the Sunnis, when they saw ISIS, they said, oh, this is our hope. And here, we should line up behind ISIS and support ISIS. But ISIS, who is ISIS? ISIS, group of young, manipulated, fanatic Muslims from Chechnya, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, North Africa. And actually, all, most of them, I, I can tell you, the ISIS themselves, the, the real ISIS, not the people who get uh, are recruited by them within Iraq, because now they are saying 90% of ISIS are Iraqi Sunnis. Let's say that 10% of those ISIS who came from outside the country, they, <laughs> I don't know how many of you know Zuhair Sharba, the president of uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce in Najaf, who came here and visited and stayed a month with our brother and sister, Steve and Christine. I met him last week, well, before I come a few days, he said, I'm so disappointed to read in the news that Minnesota is the largest exporter of terrorists to the Middle East. Between two branches, ISIS. So uh, I, I smile and tell them, yeah, we have big Somali community. <laughs> and Beside the Somali, we have the Pakistani, we have others, but none of the Iraqis. I mean, Iraq, before 2003, in 2002, before the invasion, a Zionist, Bernard Levy, Bernard something Levy, was born in Algeria, he's about 64 years old, uh, then 
migrated to France. Uh, occasionally, he ran for office in Israel. He's an author. Mr. Levy, he is the one who initiated all these militias, not only in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Libya, in each so-called the Arab Supreme Revolutionaries, he was with them, amazingly. Guide them, speaks Arabic to them, and tell them what to do. But in Iraq in 2002, when he came to initiate a unit called at Tawheed Wal Jihad, Saddam Hussein's intelligence got him. I mean, right after him, and he escaped. And never any units of these militia were established in Iraq. And as I said earlier, the Congressional 9 11 Committee proved that Saddam's regime was, and the contrary, actually uh, uh, was the enemy of Al Qaeda at that time, or any. Uh, see, the U.S. policies within this period of the Arab Spring last five years toppled the most secular leaders in the Middle East and helped to bring all these extreme religious extremists instead. For what? Now, the whole area being evacuated from people, people are either refugees, escapes, killed. They don't want to be there anymore, as I said, because Iraq today is better than tomorrow, not only in Iraq, it's in Syria, it's in Egypt, it's in Yemen, and also in Libya. So when the people are leaving the land, the land would be easier to control and take advantage of its economic resources. While when Saddam was in power, Muammar Gaddafi was in power, Nasser or Sadat or even Mubarak, they had in each country of that Arab world uh, Assad, the current one, and his father. Very strong armies, organized, trained, and always when there is war between Arab, the enemies of Israel, they all march together. And of course, they lose their wars against Israel uh, due to the involvement of the US uh, always there backing Israel. So now, no armies. We have militias. Even no security, a simple security agency to track some simple crimes in Iraq. It's amazing. Crimes happen, but no accountability because it's so chaotic, you cannot find the criminal. talking about these small uh, uh, crimes done by some crazy people. But because now the whole country is engaged to fight ISIS in the, in the north, we don't have such crimes happening, fortunately. I was asked, where is the Iraqi oil is going. Of course, we have 80% of the oil in the south, which is under the control of the government. In the past, we knew some pipes are running and pumping oil without meters, but who is getting that oil, we don't know. But we, like people talk about it. Kirkuk has 7% and 13% in 
and the northern side, the Kurdish area. Kirkuk has been taken by the Kurdish authority after ISIS to, to cover Mosul in June 10th, 2014. So the 20% of the oil in the northern side is to a total of that 20% co uh, controlled by the Kurdish authority, and they are producing, it, producing the oil, uh, stocking it in piles, storing it, and marketing without sharing any information with the central government. So it's like 100% uh, uh, a Kurdish operation, pure operation, to benefit from that oil, and we know the oil is going to Israel uh, as well from that area. Now when ISIS uh, controlled some areas beside Mosul, there are some production facilities. They used some engineers, Syrian engineers, because total of uh, oil wells that controlled by ISIS in Syria and Iraq, about a dozen, 11, 12. But in Iraq, there's a production of 175,000 to 200,000. Uh, right now, it's the oil of that area produced by ISIS. And ISIS is selling it cheap as like $25 per barrel, up to $60. And the major customer of ISIS are the Peshmerga, the Kurdish uh, uh, armed forces. Sometimes they sell it at two dollars to let the uh, tankers smuggling the oil and go through the checkpoints without question. And this oil is going to Turkey, Iran, and Jordan by traders, oil traders who are good in smuggling the oil out of the country. <laughs> Part of what uh, have been suffering in Iraq to learn about a movie called the American Sniper. And Iraqis, well, they learned that in the movie they filmed the coffin of Chris Kyle, the young American sniper, was laid in by 160 gold Eagle Medal. That's the number of that Iraqis were killed. The coffin of yeah, the coffin of Chris Kyle was laden, put on 100, uh, 160 gold Eagle Medals. Uh, and that's the number of the Iraqis who were killed. Of course, he, uh, in his book, said he killed more than that. Killed about 250 or 40, 60, I, I don't recall. Those killed Iraqis supposed to sacrifice themselves for that freedom and democracy. But they didn't get it. Now. And here, we promulgate in this country and celebrate the triumph of Chris Kyle, the sniper, the American sniper. So we help to do more hate crimes and promote animosity toward Muslims and here comes the role of Islamophobia and how we, the U.S., uh, uh, feed that concept, unfortunately.
a friend of mine, American friend from here, who wrote me and said, Sammy, I watched that movie. Others shed some tears watching it. But where are the customers of the preemptive war? We didn't see them. But sooner or later, they will know that they were lied to. There is no such freedom and democracy happened in Iraq, never. You know, Chris Kyle was killed by another Iraq base. And I think that Iraq vets who killed Chris Kyle, he killed himself actually, because both or most of the participated in Iraq war of our children here, men and women in uniform, who got killed about 4,500, but who came back, they came mentally disturbed. And because they came mentally disturbed, they found out they were lied to. They told them, go kill that enemy. And the enemy was just an old woman or old man and child. So there was no enemy over there. When they came back, they found the enemy is them. And they start shooting themselves. In 2006 alone, there was a report telling the total of U.S. Iraq vets who participated, suicide rate was about more than what in Iraq got killed. The number of the soldiers get killed in Iraq. So still, this issue is affecting us here. And believe me, I'm here now. I feel really good. I drink good water. Electricity never goes off. I have some dollars in my pocket. I can enjoy myself. I rented a car. I go around. We have a new toilets here. <laughs> so tomorrow is better than today here. But Iraq is in the contrary. And Iraq today is better than tomorrow. I don't want to bring it, I mean, make it so gloomy and dark and, and, and sad, but this is the real uh, situation and the actual, actual situation what's going on in Iraq, and, and, and I have to tell you this. Rasuli means the messenger, so <laughs> I hope you take it. But the good news is the people talking about the new prime minister is nicer than Al Maliki, Mr. Al Abadi. It looks like people like him. And the first thing he did when he assumed his position, he ordered not to bomb the Sunnis area, which that was good. But they still do. He is not in control. Each Iraqi official in office has an American advisor. Tell them what to do. This is a fact. I was told by a previous minister, and this previous Iraq minister uh, said it as clear as it is that Iraqi government is not its own 
action. It's telling them what to do. Whether it's Maliki, to bomb the Sunni, or not to bomb the Sunni, Allah God. Taken over Tikrit just recently. In April 5th, the Iraqi government announced that Tikrit now is freed from ISIS. The Iraqi militia that backed by the Iranian asked the U.S. not to bomb and not to use their air power. And the reason why, <laughs> because they believe the U.S. is bombing Iraqi forces instead of ISIS. And it happened, and sometimes the American side goes, sorry, that was a mistake whether it's by drone or by real uh, uh, pirates. Also, Iraqis, this is what people are talking about, that seeing some planes that comes in the Iraqi air and drop food and equipment and, and, and arms for ISIS. <laughs> So at, at a point, Iraqi, not the government, the government doesn't say anything about this, nothing. But the leaders of the Iraqi militia that the people formed, they call it al hajj al-Shari. They are talking about that and they are uh, presenting reports about it. So the US, with whom, against whom, that's unknown. When the Libyan type ISIS militia in Libya killed 25 Coptic, Egyptian Coptic, Christian Coptics, right away well, the quantity I cannot imagine, I saw the video, it's it's in YouTube, you can see it. And the border of Libyan Egyptian borders, uh, nobody knows who dropped by parachutes from planes, uh, weapons and boxes of uh, munitions uh, in, in a quantity that you cannot believe how much. I mean, you drive and drive and drive and drive and you see weapons all over the borders. Why? Of course, we know why, but who is doing this? And also we know who is doing this when we read between the eyes, but between the lines, but uh, there is no uh, solid evidence to accuse this uh, uh, party or that party, but we always uh, uh, look, for the, look for the money. I mean, uh, follow the money or follow the benefits, who is benefiting from this, as I mentioned earlier. Follow the money, I learned this here. <laughs> I delivered a letter of Mayor, the Honorable Mayor Betsy Hodges to the Honorable uh, President of Najaf Provincial Council about two weeks ago. And the letter was a friendly one, uh, assuring the Iraqi party that Minneapolis is keen to strengthen the relationship between uh, both cities since they formed the sister city relationship in 2009. And there was uh, an invitation included to visit. So, uh, we are expecting about uh, a dozen members of Najaf Provisional Council to visit Minnesota next month, early next month. Uh, this effort being done by my colleague Kathy McKay, the head of IRP, and the board members of that uh, organization, our partner, and we're working
working together to, for preparation to put the schedule together. And of course, <laughs> this uh, delegation, we were joking, uh, it's part of the government, and you know the government is so corrupted in Iraq. Uh, they compete with the government of Haiti, Somalia, and Myanmar in corruption. So uh, according to the International Transparency Agency is saying like Iraq uh, uh, with the competition with those other countries in corruption comes sometimes first, second, third, or fifth. So <laughs> uh, we'll see probably uh, if we have a public hearing when we have this government officials here, uh, I would like you to question them about their good deeds and what they have done in Iraq, especially in Najaf. We still are uh, doing the Water for Peace project, uh, mainly maintaining those units that we have built. So to make sense, uh, they don't uh, get uh, bad or uh, neglected, so we have to maintain them. We have about 100 schools that uh, uh, installed in them the water ventilation systems. And each uh, produces about 200 gallons a day of good water. So between 30 to 50,000 kids in Najaf are drinking good water while, while they are in school. We uh, did as MPT, with the help of other organizations, including IRP, help uh, to put trees in one of main streets in Najaf. We call it Minneapolis Street. Uh, and also put garbage dumpsters because the local government, which 13 of them will be here next month, <laughs> failed to pick up those garbage. And when we had delegation coming from the U.S., part of their schedule to pick up garbage too in one day for one hour, symbolic that the garbage or debris that uh, uh, the occupation years and invasion caused it. So you're responsible for that. Mm -hmm. So make sure when you come and visit next time. Yeah. So all uh, these uh, work we've been doing this. Besides, uh, now in Najaf, the Christmas celebration becoming tradition. So working with young students, college students, to celebrate Christmas, which is, didn't happen before, in the main streets called Arawan, and that uh, uh, annoys some uh, religious figures, but then we tell them, hey, Jesus mentioned in Quran 25 times. They said, okay, okay, <laughs> then you're right. So we're doing that uh, and many, many other things uh, uh, beside uh, partnering a huge movement in South Korea for peace led by Man He Lee, an ex Korean vet who is leading really a huge movement for peace in Korea, not only because they uh, border with North Korea, the dangerous North Korea, but uh, they uh, promote peace uh, in the whole world. And they approached me uh, to submit uh, a proposal project that uh, bring Iraq and peace together. And the Iraqis were happy uh, because this Korean is not Shia, is not Sunni, is Buddhist. <laughs> so uh, his involvement would be pure without any self-interest. And also he's not American or European looking for oil. So uh, I think that might happen. So we're working on that. So this is a, a brief report about our work. And I really thank you for listening. The question is why the U.S. is giving blind eye to what the Saudis are doing in Yemen. 
and why the Arab uh, didn't Arab leaders didn't build the coalition against the Saudi Arabia uh, movement and, and the war against Yemen. Uh, let's start from the last. Uh, the Saudi Arabia, with the absence of Saddam Hussein, Hosni Mubarak, Muammar al-Qadhafi, now is taking the lead and blessed with the U.S. Of course, Saudi cannot do anything without. I talked about the Iraqi official government have advisors in their office, American advisors. The Saudi Arabia from their person, they established their kingdom is run by the U.S. And don't forget, 9-11, there were 16, 15 or 16 hijackers, Saudis. But Saudi was not invaded, Iraq was invaded. Was zero hijacker from Iraq, you remember that. So, uh, in addition, I would like to uh, say the uh, foreign minister of Yemen in Sharm el-Sheikh just about a few days ago, he announced saying, addressing Israel to sleep certain that all the, Hezbo not Hezbollah, but Houthis, Rockets, Iranian rockets have been destroyed in Al Hudaydah, uh, uh, south of Sana'a. Uh, so, uh, this is what all I, I mentioned that the only beneficiary of what's going on is the state of Israel momentarily, momentarily, right now, within this chaotic situation. Thank you. Good question. Some have suggested that the solution. Um, implying that the U.S. is still there, right? <laughs> I mean, they have a huge embassy. The embassy, those 5,000 employees at, the, at that embassy are supposed to serve us. But shut down, closed. And what's, is, what's their real uh, uh, job? Actually, it's intelligent. It's spying and controlling the country, uh, but not the all, uh, I mean, only country, Iraq, of Iraq, but uh, all Middle East, and uh, orchestrating what's going on. That's what I believe. Well, now, what's going to happen if they move there? I, I assure you, peace will happen. Because I've been telling all, I mean, all uh, years since the U.S. moved in Iraq, I've been telling this story, and you, you heard me saying, if the U.S. butt out from Iraq and be in Ferguson or other places <laughs> that's needed, so Iraq will be, and other Arab countries will be safe. Believe me. You said that the, that the Kurds are selling oil uh, that goes to Turkey and, uh, or maybe to ISIS. I'm not quite sure, but, but I thought that the Kurds were fighting ISIS. Yeah, uh, I have here a map. If you like, I can give it to you. Uh, it shows where ISIS is and what oil fields ISIS is controlling, how they move the oil to Turkey, Iran, and Jordan through Embar. Because now, after freeing Tikrit, it's called province of Salah al-Din. Al-Ambar province is still uh, under control of ISIS and also Musa. Uh, they control Najma field oil, al gayara this is in Mosul, and also they control Ajil and Himrin. So these four major oil fields they produce about, they produce about uh, close to 200,000 uh, uh, 
barrel a day, which makes four ices with low prices, $3 million a week, to pay the soldiers at rate of 500 per piece, and the leaders 1,200. How they move it? Okay, there are corrupted Bishmerga who accept the oil or the money to just give a blind eye to have these move. They fight, but there are corruption, as I said in the beginning. Iraq, the most corrupted country you know today in the world. And those corrupted officials, sometimes they arrest them, kill them, but always there is a way to move by tankers, not by pipelines, but by trucks, tankers. Uh, uh, a tanker is sold by ISIS at 4,200 uh, 4, for about uh, 30 tons of oil, tanker. So uh, this tanker is sold in Jordan at $15,000. This is the difference of how much the profit that uh, the trader, oil trader, uh, makes. So this oil trader bribe the people at the border, the people, and the people in Jordan, at the border with Jordan, are Sunnis and are uh, with ISIS, siding with ISIS right now. Uh, but uh, the Kurdish people also, uh, they are Sunni, of course, uh, but they uh, are bribed by the traders and Kurdish traders. Now, now we can, if, if you uh, come closer to the picture, you find this Kurdish trader has a cousin or a brother working with the Bishmerg, benefiting him or her some money so to allow these uh, tankers go through. Let's see if you're aware of an active left in Iraq, of the socialists and the communists. They're organizing against the continued occupation of, of Iraq by the United States and NATO. Yeah. B by the way, Najaf is the capital of Shiitism in the world. And uh, the first Imam of Shia, Imam Ali, is buried there. But Najaf is, has been embedding the leader of the communist party in Iraq, was from Najaf, Salam Adil. And Salam Adil is an uncle of my uncle's wife. It's so close. <laughs> and also, Najaf produced Ba'thi's leader. And there are some agnostic, atheist, but the whole uh, 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 dominated figures in Najaf are Shia. So the Iraq Communist Party, unfortunately, is corrupted too. Not to that degree, as I said. For example, Majid Saeed, or Hamid Saeed, the leader of the whole uh, uh, Communist Party in Iraq, when Abramar started asking, come on, let's give you some seats in the parliament and some uh, uh, government position. So I need those sects. Uh, uh, and, and uh, ethnic background that Iraq forms. So the Turkoman came, and the Sunnis came, and the Shia came, and when Hamid Said came, he asked, what are you? He said, I'm communist. No, 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 no. We need those sects and ethnic groups. He said, then, I'm Shia. He said, okay, here is a seat. <laughs> so he was given the communist that you mentioned, a seat because he is Shia, not communist. And by the way, we made a joke about this because in Arabic, communist is Shiyoi. Shiyoi. And Shi'i, it's only difference between the O and I. So we placed Shiyoi, Shi'i, each other, and, and we let it go. But I know, and it's a fact, the most honorable 
and honest movement, political movement in Iraq is the communist. Uh, the problem is they never assumed a, a, a government leadership so we know if they are corrupted or not yet. <laughs> so we have to wait and see. They, in Najaf, they run for offices, but unfortunately, they were not elected. The question is, you have spoken a lot about the consequences of violence in Iraq. Corruption, hate crimes, ISIS, Israelis benefit, benefiting, and misuse of authority on behalf of Iraqis, both civilians and government officials. Yet you do not mention much about the positive side of the improvement happening in Iraq and the battle against ISIS. The efforts of many Iraqi citizens to bring back the country to its best well-being, the lives of those lost to save the country and its people from evil, these are all things that I'm hearing about every day from my family and friends. Can you tell us more about the positive? Personally, when I see the people of Iraq killing each other and claiming victories, I think it's not victory. It's a tragedy. Like taking over to create to kill to create people is tragedy. I focused on how those young people are manipulated, whether they are Sunnis or Shia. Today there is a real crisis, which is the sectarian war. Positive things, help me, sir. Tell me what are you close? You have relatives. You have. I mean, complete my mission and tell them about the positive. The Iraqi government, because the drop of the prices of oil, it cuts off in education and health and lots of things, even in salaries of the people. Just because they are stealing the money. They are actually sharing the revenue with the people who brought them in, brought the Iraqi government in, which is the US. I was a panelist, and they were talking about the price of the freedom and democracy. It should be harsh now, but later. Like they bring some, some speakers, they brought examples that how uh, Europe took them like 100 years or 200 years until they get things better. But the wheel is there. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I, I, I don't want to wait 200 years uh, until Iraq gets better. I just want now the US and its allies get out of Iraq. Then Iraq will be better.